I don't prep for any of these shows I go on. Yeah. <laughs> as you can as you can tell from watching them, so I'm okay. <laughs> you are a very busy man. You're I don't know how you do it all. How how do you manage your time? So you know what's weird? Um because I spent a lot of time driving a taxi, mm-hmm. I don't consider this, I guess, busy, and I don't consider it as adverse as it looks. Because mm-hmm. I'm used to driving like 5 a.m. to 5 p.m., doing stand-up at night, and usually writing before I went to my taxi garage. So it's like, I'm kind of doing that schedule now, but I'm not getting like shot at and choked by <laughs> hobbits. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like I interact with less time travelers on a daily basis than I did in a taxi. So to answer your question, I think the management thing is like a perspective thing. Yeah. It's like if you're kind of in like a good headspace, you just kind of keep it in front of you. It's very like it's incremental. Like I definitely don't sit down like Monday night and lay out my Tuesday so much as I just lay out the wake up process, the get to Fox process. And then you just kind of, you're on the people mover from there. Yeah. Yeah. The It's funny. I feel the same way. And I feel like we have that similarity of just having a kind of working class background, which yeah. I don't know that that many people in media actually <laughs> have. No. <laughs> no, they have no perspective. Like, I no. always say that to myself. Like, I could never call up the cab driver, me, and tell him about the rough day the media figure is having. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't understand, bro. I had to get makeup three times and talk for four minutes each time. I I know you just got stabbed on the Van Wick by a guy with no pants on. But if you could pour one out for me, because I'm going through a lot today in the makeup chair. Yeah, I think of Bridget. Although it's really funny. I keep threatening to my husband that I'm going to go get a job at the Chili's that's opening up because I'm like, at least the people are abusive to your face <laughs> when you're waiting <laughs> like, tables. Yeah, no, there's, there's, a, there's a respect to that. Like, Bridget, I always say that about, for real, like driving a cab is the original social media. Yeah. Because people get in and they post on your wall yeah. to your face, like whether you agree or disagree. But one sidebar, you should be a Chili's waitress for no other reason <laughs> than because you would read them their truth. And I'd sign up for that. I loved waiting tables. It's how I made all my money until, I mean, until I started making money writing. But even when I was writing, I was still waiting tables. And that was awkward because people would be like, I read your Playboy piece. Can I have more iced tea? (laughs) 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 There's always that awkward transition. Well, the way my radio show went today, I'll probably be waiting tables soon. What happened? I'll let you know if the game has changed. Tell me. No, nah, it was actually pretty good. We were we were stuck in the bloodbath space today, like most of the media. Uh-huh. With the old repurposing of Trump's remark thing. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And uh for radio <laughs> I was like, I'll like, show you a bloodbath. It's my <laughs> monthly period. <laughs> oh, there it is. Bang! You still got it, kid. You have no idea. I'm so happy to be talking to you because the thing about you and me out there in the social media sphere. It's like, you know how you never see two homeless guys on the same corner because their crazies <laughs> cancel each other out? Like, so you and me on the same pot, it's weird because, like, you're asking for a quarter. You know, I might be asking for 10 cents, but we mm-hmm. have a similar weird. I was just arguing with a parking meter. You just punched a cat. Mm-hmm. And here it's we true. are. And I'm just, I'm so fascinated to see how this goes. No one's seen us in the same place at the same time. <laughs> We're like Maxine Waters and Al Roker. <laughs> you never see them together. I, I'm, I have a theory they're the same guy. So tell me about the the blood. Yeah, the, I was watching your video of interviewing the Spring Breakers, which was cracking me up. Oh, thank you. Um, but I, w- I mean, is it just Florida that everybody's pro-Trump? Is it cherry-picked? Is it... Is it something different? Like if you did that in New York, would you also find that a lot of people you might not expect are voting for Trump? In a party atmosphere, yes, because the Trump crowd is kind of synonymous with a good time. As much as he talks about grievance, the border and outsourcing jobs and stuff like that, the actual vibe of the Trump crowd is one of fun. Like he opens his rallies with a blooper reel. They have musical numbers they do. You know what I'm saying? They're like, we can't go to the bathroom. They're about to do lock her up. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) So 
in that <laughs> regard, the Trump experience is one of overwhelming positivity. Uh -huh. I would say in party spheres, you would expect a little bit of that. Now, the caveat to me interviewing people on spring break, we legit talked to 100 people. Those were the 30 or 40 that had enough motor skills to be portrayed on camera without accusing us of some type of libel. Right. But if you were to look at those people, because that was 2 a.m. at the Elbow Room, mm -hmm. the one note of caution, if you were a Trump supporter watching this, is 90% of the people in that video can't be reliably counted on to vote. Right. That's the thing. That was yeah, my next I, question. Will Are they going to vote? <laughs> yeah. So no, I, and the answer to that is no. I don't know that all those people are going to vote. But I have a 15-year-old kid, and the one thing I would say is Trump is the only way 15-year-old kids can can actually be like punk rock nowadays. I know. Whether you like him or not is irrelevant. The most counterculture thing you can do is be like, yeah, I'm a Trump guy. Yeah. Like I had my son on my Saturday night show two weeks ago. Fun. And me and him talk about stuff a lot, but he's more of a sports guy than a politics guy. But after having him on my show, I'm pretty sure he stormed the Capitol. Like, I, <laughs> like, I, like as I was interviewing him, I was like, where was he January 6th? Because, like, I don't remember. I think there was, like, a school trip or something. Like, my son is <laughs> out there. Like, way out there. But it was pretty entertaining. That's what he said. It was a yeah. school trip. <laughs> I'm like, Lincoln, why does your school teacher have a buffalo hat on? That's weird. <laughs> Two horns on top of it. That's funny. Yeah, I have nephews who are older and they are definitely have always been a little bit of like, that's the way to rebel or be kind of counterculture, which is makes sense and hilarious. But, you know, they grew up playing video games and they've grown up in like the... Uh, I remember they 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 tell me the funniest stories of being a a student during the Trump years. <laughs> oh well, <laughs> just how crazy their teachers all went and were openly just weeping in school and saying crazy things. And um, my husband was going to get his. Uh, masters and he he was oh, we're both late bloomers and that he had a professor who said basically felt that all conservatives should like it you should it should be in the DSM as a mental illness <laughs> <laughs> ah, I love that and he's you know center right comes from a very conservative family they're probably further right than you know, but you, we you know are. what I think it is like, honestly, is I think a lot of people on that side are lazy. And what I mean by lazy, OK, just to you know, preface this is they would rather label an entire group of people and dismiss them than put in the three seconds it takes to think critically and maybe have a nuanced conversation. Because most people who vote Trump, like my wife that grew up on a dairy farm in Ohio. And um, for real. And, you know, she was like one of those gals who had no idea how much better she could do. She didn't know her street value. Yeah. You know, if you're on a farm, you know what I'm saying? You're eating your pets on your birthday. So anyway, there's a, there's like a, you know, there's a realness to that. But I think <laughs> a lot of his voters, because they are rural working class people, they have a little more of a work ethic. And it's not to say there aren't really successful, hardworking liberals. I know a lot of them. But I think they cater. It's weird. It's like an intellectual laziness. Like, back to the bloodbath thing. You have to be really lazy for that to effectively work with you, for you to believe, okay, that that 15-second clip is representative of the entire speech or the entire rationale for Trump using that phrase. Whereas the average person might watch that and have a self enough, uh, enough self-awareness to go, hey, am I making myself look bad by sharing this out of context? <laughs> no one's doing that on the... <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right, but that's what's so nuts. But then they're the ones who, like you said, would categorize us as being of a mental illness. Yeah. And that's what's weird. But and you like, don't have to have... You can be shamelessly wrong if... It, this is the thing that... Because I come from the left, and that was yep. something that... I, I think, I think we live in a very shameless time in general. It's, it's oh, yeah, not, totally. it's bipartisan shamelessness definitely, for definitely, sure. Definitely. But 
I do think because of the the kind of power they that the left has over media, even the stuff with like Fanny recently, you can be shamelessly wrong and it doesn't matter. But this I again, this is kind of true for everyone because the media cycle will just keep going. But you don't have to really you can share that and know you're wrong and it doesn't even matter. It's like people know the lie gets out of, you know, it gets around the world before the truth is out of bed. You know what I you know what I think it is for real, too? I just think likes in general are like the death of everything. Yeah, because they are digital dopamine. (laughs) And the reason, like you were just saying, people can share it knowing they're wrong is because they know they're going to get that dopamine fix. That's because a crazy, it's a, yeah, go on. It's No, no, but it's nuts, but that's where we've kind of broken the compass. Yeah. Because everybody's in a race to the top of Mount Clickmore, <laughs> and, it's, and it's a lot easier to climb that mountain if you're disingenuous. Totally. Than, than if you're nuanced. My- Nobody tunes in for like, eh. But if you and me were to, were to, were to caption this episode like, so-and-so should go before a firing squad, <laughs> a lot more people are going to listen. And then if we're like weighing the pros and cons, which is what we're supposed to be doing, but nobody wants to have that conversation. That's inefficient. So tell us who should be in front of the firing squad and let's get on with our lives. That's where we are now. It's even it's bizarre. F- it's so bizarre and also hilarious because on Twitter now with community notes, people will share something that gets thousands of retweets and is wrong and they will leave it up even after yes. it gets corrected. Don't so, care. You want to laugh <laughs> about that? So Joe Scarborough, if you if you saw that yesterday got checked into the boards by Elon Musk. Elon, like, personally, community noted him on the bloodbath thing. Mm. So Scarborough deletes the tweet, okay, where he knows there'll be pushback, but immediately got on his show this morning and, like, quadrupled down on it. On his show, he actually said the words bullshit. Uh, You know, no offense to the listeners, I apologize, but he said, he's like, oh, everybody knows the whole idea that this was about the auto industry is bullshit. I mean, it was a bloodbath. It was a call to violence. We all know that. And we don't all know that. Like, we don't know that. No. And But that's back to your other point about us. We're kind of living in the death of shame. Is that because we just root against the other side so hard. Like, this is like the only moment of true substance I can offer the world. Like, I'm new enough to media that, like, I genuinely care. So I have it in my head. In my head. And again, this is something I'll outgrow. But I'm actually like trying to help. And what I mean by that is I'm just trying to get people to chill the fuck out. Yeah. Okay. That's what I'm trying to do. I don't believe one party, and I don't think you do either, is going to out argue the other side into submission. Like no one in the history of political disagreement has ever been like, you got me. You know what I'm saying? So I think the only way I can actually help is if I could just get enough people to downshift. Yeah. We might have the rational conversation you or me are having. I think everybody else comes into this from the fallacy of, like, we're going to win. You know, we're going to own the libs. We're going to shut down MAGA. And no one's doing that. Yeah. And the reason I say I want to abandon the model is because the one thing nobody mentions, it's like a really, we talk about an inconvenient truth, uh, to borrow from Al Gore parlance, is like, we are actually teammates in this country. Like, if there's a war tomorrow, okay, you can be a Republican, I can be a Democrat, I can be a Democrat, be whatever it is. The point is we're on the same team, but it's so lost on so many people in media now who fashion themselves as like generals yeah. in a war against the other side. Yeah. And that's where we're really missing the point. I'm like, the division is screwing the country. So it's sad that I'm like a 47-year-old man who plays video games and I'm sort of, you know, functioning as a default voice of reason yeah. for a small faction of society is horrifying to me. I get I it. I went to community college. I made Majored in Zelda. No. Okay. I shouldn't be doing this. I get it. I, I think we're very, very similar and have a similar function in the in the space. Yep. And even even just it, it's the only reason people are listening to us is because they're searching for some. I have this bit that I've been working out that it it's it could be really great. It could be really simple, but I want it to be really great. But the whole concept is basically America's too fat for a civil war. And I've said this on Twitter and I've made this. I wrote a like kind of satirical piece about it because people don't, you know, you have these pundits who will throw this around where they're like, ah, we're going to we're on the verge of a civil war. I'm like, can you play that tape forward exactly? Like, what does that look like (laughs) in your brain? 
You who, know what I say about a civil war? Like, unless they have an app. Who's have that, who's having this fight? Yeah, exactly. Who's you're, it's not like red. It's not north versus south. This is it would be rural versus cities, and it would yeah. it's not. And even then, it it's so America's we, actually quite diverse ideologically yeah. when you get granular. Yep. And it's just like such a weird. I'm like, no one's getting. We have pizza delivered to our door that's cooked for us. <laughs> They didn't have that the last Civil War. And I bet if they did, they wouldn't have had a Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> they were like three good apps away from not having a Civil War. <laughs> like if we had a gaming system, you know, where was where was the Nintendo Wii? At least they were fighting for something Steam? too. Like what are what are we fighting? What how do we know the war is over? What is the it's it makes no sense to me. And it's such a like lazy, I don't know, it feels so lazy to me. That's where we're at. Yeah. But you know what? A lot of people, it's become like a lifestyle. Yeah. They get out of bed to just hate another thing. And uh, I don't know how we, like, honestly, I I genuinely don't know how we break the cycle other than, like, I think if people, (laughs) let's say we had, like, a five-day moratorium on social media. I think if people ever walked away from this for a week, they'd realize how unnecessary it was. Because it's like, let's say there was no Twitter. Twitter goes down for five days, okay? When you get back on in day six, you're going to update us on what you ate, (laughs) what you did, what you watched. And we're all going to realize how unnecessary it is for us to tell strangers everything about us. Like, I always say that about, like, dinner pictures. Like, 20 years ago, if you were to take a picture of your dinner, go and get it developed, and then drive back to a group of strangers, (laughs) like, they would put you in a home. They wouldn't think there was any reason for you to be telling them that you had lasagna, even if you cooked the lasagna, even if you would never cook lasagna, but you were inspired by a TV show that everyone should go watch. They still wouldn't care about what you had for dinner. They just wouldn't. I don't know, though, because I've seen those memes like making fun of they're like, oh, no one took pictures of their food. But then it's like all the the stills of food that painters painted. (laughs) (laughs) Where it's like the milk is glue. <laughs> yeah, and and I do I do wonder too because there was that phenomenon of like people would go on their travels and then they would hold you hostage and show you yeah. what they ate on their cruise <laughs> in the like you know the the little slide. So there was some of that. I think Neil Brennan had a really great bit about this where he's like, you know, you have these idiots online. Like everyone's like a king now. They all are like showing their buffet to the pores. And he was like, people go online and they'll be like, Mozart, thumbs down. You know, like the Ninth Symphony, thumbs down. Like you have any concept. Uh, It's just, yeah, it's weird. I We had... um, secret shoppers when I was waiting tables and we lived in fear of those people because you never knew who they were and they would judge everything from the minute they walked in the door. But everyone's a fucking secret shopper now. (laughs) Everyone. Everyone. That's that's another great, it's like a scourge of social media. I, I know I hate this more than anything in the world. It's like everybody, and to my credit, I've never done this. I've never tagged a brand or an airline when I was like dissatisfied with an experience, but everyone has done that at some point. And what I wish airlines would do, because they respond if you have big followers, you know, you get big retweets and they're generally genuinely in the wrong. But I think airline, I think we should go on offense against this. Like this would be a good job for you and me. Let's (laughs) say we go somewhere like United where the tires are falling off. Like they need the help. You know what I'm saying? But we go on offense because a lot of times people tweet a complaint that gets no likes, no retweets because they have three followers. But they've been given to this lifestyle. And maybe we could read people their truth. Maybe it would give because this is what I think we're suffering from. Bridget. I think it's like a lack of self-awareness. Yeah. And I say that as a man who wears leopard print on TV. Okay. there is a lack of self-awareness in society. And I think that's where social media has kind of broken the compass. So what would you do if you went on offense? Well, in, in all honesty, you know, if depending on the person, you've got to look at their profile. So if someone says like, oh, my, you know, my flight took off two hours and 10 minutes late. I was supposed to be here. I was supposed to be here. Well, we at, we at United are just happy you fit in the seat. You yeah. know what I mean? If they were fat. You know, yeah. the point is 
you find a reason to to kick back. I don't have a. I need a specific account to go after, but my default is fat because I'm like a 500 pound man trapped in a 300 pound man's body. <laughs> <laughs> I love your book. It's basically dumpster fire in book format. When I was reading it, I was like, this is essentially a, 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 a retelling of everything we've covered in dumpster fire since we started that show in 2018 or 2019. Because it's a lot of a lot of what it is that you're going after, right? Yeah. Is cold. It's like slacktivism. That's what I always say. Everything that gets canceled, like literally everything. Offers a deliverable to no one but the worst human beings who've ever lived, <laughs> meaning the people who drive cancels, people nobody liked. I, I say this like a lot, like cancel culture existed before social media. Like there were there were people who got mad at comedians. We just didn't call them cancel culture. We called them losers, you know, but it took social media and that digital dopamine of likes to actually empower these people to affect change. Yeah. Because the likes could horrify corporations into <laughs> acting. So, like, you could literally, like, my favorite story is the Washington Redskins. Like, a Native American tribe donated the Redskins. But white people took it away. <laughs> On behalf of the Native Americans. Like, it's bananas. <laughs> It's all been so wild. I think one of the first things they were they were trying to cancel like Renoir or someone. It's always funny to me when they're trying to cancel dead guys. I'm like, <laughs> this person's dead. You're coming for yeah. them. But like, it's I Renoir. feel like um how's how's the book how is the response? I feel like it I feel like it's not getting the attention it deserves. That's my Aww. opinion. Well, it did good. Like it hit the bestseller list. So for me, like that's you can amazing. lay your hat on that and then be like, ah, oh, I went to community college. I made the bestseller list. But you want to know something? What, what does hurt the book, I think, is as much as the book covered like seminal things, I think there have been bigger seminal events since it came out. Like there's a chapter in the book about Shane Gillis, but Shane Gillis hosted Saturday Night Live after the book came out. You know, a lot of like a lot of like what I was talking about it at, in academia at universities were protests that absolutely got leapfrogged by all like the pro Hamas stuff and everything in between. And I think where the book is like kind of validated when it comes to the campus analysis is I was saying in the book that college campuses are essentially just trying to make money. They don't care. They're on board with any student protest that happens. If it's, you know, if it's good for the bottom line, they just want to keep these kids happy and paying big money. And I think that was born out in like the Harvard experience with Claudia and Gay. Right. It's like, she's plagiarizing stuff. They're, <sighs> they're the most anti-Semitic people I've ever heard. But it's like the college was in no rush to condemn them. If the donors didn't actually pull out or threaten to, that stuff would still be going on at Harvard. Right. So- in a lot of ways, I feel like it was validated, but in a lot of other ways, it could be more relevant. But I made the mistake of like launching a TV show and releasing a stand-up special in the same week. So uh, I don't know if they cancel each other out, but whatever. We're having fun. What? How is the TV show going? I'm excited about this. Oh, you stop it. Um, we're, you know, so we launched, we're in episode 10 right now. Okay. So what's the, for, what's the gist? Well, it's, that's certainly longer than we expected it to last. Uh, the gist is, <laughs> it's what I say on the radio, okay? I'm in the chill the fuck out business. Yeah. So we go out of our way to describe the show as a cable news keg party where everybody's welcome, regardless of how they voted, because real comedy doesn't have a political party. Real comedy is a party. Like, that's the hook. So it shouldn't be, you know, checking ID of how you voted at the door. It should very much be just chill out, have fun. So to that regard, it's working. Like we win our time slot and we beat like the next two closest shows would be on CNN and MSNBC, but we do beat them combined. Okay. Now, some of that is a testament to Fox just being a bigger channel. Yeah. But a lot of it is a testament that we're bringing in a lot of people, like according to the demo, that tune in just for the show because it's really different from anything else on cable news. And again, that's a testament to me being this person who's new and is mindful on how he impacts the culture with the minimal reach that he has. Yeah. I, I want to be able to look back at whatever this fleeting window of relevance happens to be and say that I used it to be a comic and not an activist. Because there's is... nothing I hate more than comedy masquerading as activism or, you know, activism masquerading as journalism. 
Oh God, I was thinking about that. It's so funny you mentioned this in your book, but I was I think about this probably once a week. The death of SNL, as I f- saw, it, was that when she dressed up like Hillary Clinton and sang Hallelujah. I still can't believe you. And you kind of reference this. Uh, you allude to the same joke that I make, where I'm like, "Did planes fly when Trump was elected?" Yeah, <laughs> like, it was like oh, 9/11 about- in the cities. Yeah, they 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 did jokes after 9/11. Yeah. But they didn't do jokes after they didn't do jokes after Trump won the election. Like in the same town, never mind that Trump hosted SNL twice. I know. I know. Think about that. Never mind that he hosted a show on NBC for 15 years. Talk about That's shameless. why the thing I get mad about for real is I really get mad that they tried to destroy Jimmy Fallon. Oh, I know. They're like he normalized Donald Trump. I'm like, dude, Donald Trump had a show on that channel for 15 years. He was his lead in. So was he like, how was he some fringe lunatic in a shed if he had a hot, the highest rated primetime show on NBC? And that's what I come back to a lot in the book and in life. And I think you see this too. It's a manufactured hysteria in that we all knew Trump. We all knew he was crass. We all knew he was pugnacious. That was just his vibe. Okay, but we didn't believe he was the leader of like a militia. We didn't believe he was advocating for a bloodbath. You know, Trump was a crass guy that was trying to get laid and be a celebrity, given to bombast on a comical level. So in a lot of ways, he's guilty of every rhetorical thing they say. He's just not guilty of the intent they're applying to him. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's why I'm like, I know I should take this seriously, but I also find it hilarious. (laughs) Yep, totally. <laughs> and in your show, do you have, so you have a panel, right? So, yes, we have a, yeah, we have a panel. Then we'll have like a few one-on-one guests. Mm-hmm. We interview people in my taxi. We're just trying to make the vibe a little different. Um, I feel like because you I feel like, and like, Landau I honestly, like, and I could save America. Yeah, I know I won't, but I can, like, I, I can't save it. I just want to give it an autonomous zone because it doesn't yeah. have one. Yeah. Like, and I don't, I I genuinely don't care enough to want to beat the other side. It's like, my background is comedy. I'm in a profession where you get paid in chicken fingers the first five years. I know. Like, we shouldn't be in charge of the economy. No. You know what I'm saying? And I wish more comics just had the self-awareness because what I feel like is like, we've lost common culture in that all of those places that used to be not even necessarily a forum to put our differences aside, just a forum to forget we even had them. It wasn't like we consciously said, I'm putting on late night, bye-bye political differences. The differences weren't that much of a dominating force in our consciousness. Yeah. And I feel like if sports, music, movies, comedy, just go back to serving their purpose, we might become a little bit less cognizant of the division. And that's what I like. I want that to be my contribution. Doesn't mean it's going to be. I'm sure I'm a contract away from just being an activist monster, but I hope not. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. There's it's there's such like a need for it. I was thinking about when I realized that the I kept saying Trump was going to win and I lost friends for even suggesting it. And <laughs> I remember the moment that I I was talking to a family member and he was like, I'm just so fucking sick of late night talking down to me. And that's, I was like, I went back to LA. I was like, we're missing something. This is in Rhode Island. You know, I'm yep. not exactly known for being a red state. And yeah. um, I was like, I think we're missing something. And this was, I was obsessed with Brexit. This was right. I was over in in Ireland and in London, right on the heels of Brexit. And they kept asking me. And if that, I was like, look what, I think Trump's going to win guys. Like, yeah. I don't feel like this would be that big of a surprise. And when he mm-hmm. did the night at every, at the like party, all my friends were like, I feel like you're the well hydrated <laughs> marathon runner. <laughs> <laughs> But you, you, you want to know why he, he like, and you probably had the, you know, um, I guess I don't want to say horse sense, but that's a term we use a lot in taxi driving, but it's like, he was talking about things. It's very similar to the bloodbath incident. He was talking about things voters cared about. Right. The media was talking about things the media cares about. Right. The media talks about bloodbath, but what the rest of the people heard was China's trying to open a car factory in Mexico and steal American jobs. I won't let them do it. 
Right. If you're a worker, that's what you responded to. The word bloodbath never even, you never thought twice about it. You heard I'll protect American jobs and you were like, I'll drink to that. But that's where you're more in touch as a normal person, member of media, and maybe me to a lesser extent, a semi-normal member of media, person who's in media. Um, we're more in touch with normal people. Most of the guys I know who work in like elite media have no connection to these people. No. At all. None. Zero. None. It's like when when you look at the panels that come on to analyze Trump voters. They all have butter uh, hands. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> None of them have ever done manual labor. Nope. Mike Rowe. He's the only uh, other man in media who has done manual labor. <laughs> and my and Mike Rowe is the man. Yeah. Like, to I his love credit, him. Yes. He has like real perspective yep. and a real understanding of not only what makes people tick, but what needs to make them tick in order for them to succeed. Like I consider Mike Rowe, like I'm, I really mean this and I bust his balls whenever I see him. But I, I consider him like one of the best shining examples of what media can be. Yes. But and so Mike sorry. Rowe, Go on. No, in another era, there'd be a lot of Mike Rose. Yeah. I, people have lost, you know, they've kind of they've kind of lost touch with what made media important and I think endearing. It's yeah. not endearing. No. Like I don't tell my my son's school teachers I'm in media. I tell he's in, you know. Elementary school, I tell them I play piano in a whorehouse. <laughs> I can't say media, so, you know. The same thing. Um, <laughs> when you were saying, um, when you see these guys on panels, uh, the the people who are in media, do you, I, I don't know who they, they, that's why it is kind of funny to me that this billionaire became like, oh, that was always funny to me too. He became this, the guy with like golden toilets became the representative of like the working class. They're just so desperate for somebody, but at least he stood up for them, I think. I mean. Dude, even this is the thing. Even if he doesn't mean it, which he might not, you guys, if, the, if that's just the brand, if that's just the lane, if you benefit, you don't care. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah. It's, I, I think most people are self-aware to know that the escort doesn't like them and want to raise a family with them. <laughs> but she still serves a purpose while she's in the room. <laughs> and I think that's the transactional nature of politics in a nutshell. Yeah, you're right. It's so true. I'm excited about this show. I I was I just opened for Land, Dave Landau, and we were talking— Oh God! I we the three of us need to do something together because it would be amazing. Oh, I'm very I'm very pro Landau, but now you're talking about a third homeless guy on the same corner. No, that's why it needs to happen. It would be <laughs> it would be uh, all of our fans would go bananas. Um, well, he is the the best. But we were just talking about how necessary you know, something like what you're doing with this show is because I do believe that most late night has kind of abandoned their, like you guys are supposed to entertain the masses. Yeah, they are tired. This was, okay. this is something that I, I was on Glenn recently and he was talking, you know, it was when Fanny Willis broke Glenn Beck show and he was really yep. upset. And I was like, I understand it's, a, it's, it's an, I, you know, he's like, I just, I can see things and people, um, people just, I'm like, Glenn, people are, who aren't in this, like, they're trying to just, they get home, they have kids, you're exhausted. You put your kid down They've got homework you're dealing with. Uh, I don't know. It just, they don't, they can't be in this all the time. No, um, that's a really great point. What I think the problem, and this is where I think social media crushed society, is people say we can't coexist anymore, but I just think we're being asked to coexist too much. Right. You know, we've always had disagreements. But the people you disagreed with, you went three weeks or a month without seeing. Right. Now they're <laughs> living in a device in your pocket and they're <laughs> amplifying the disagreement for the approval of other people <laughs> that disagree with you. And you're immersed in that every hour of the day, every day of your life. And there's just no way it's healthy, man. No. Because as you know, uh, it's incentivized conflict. Like Twitter is a fight club for people who don't want to get hit. Yeah. And it's like you and me, could write anything we wanted on Twitter. Positive, funny, doesn't matter. 
it'll never have a tenth of the reach as whatever our most vile put down is on Twitter. Yeah. And Straight up. It's true. It's a it's a roast battle. It really yep. is. My my sister, who never really understood what Twitter was when I first went on, she was like, so it's just people trying to be mean and out joke each other. And I was like, yeah, pretty much. And now it's just not even funny anymore. It seems like no, it's it, just hostile. It's very hostile. It's very yeah, it's hostile. Bad. But it's but I do see, you know, the real world seems and maybe just talking about the cost of food is neutral. So that's why people always talk about it. But I don't see people talking about a lot of this stuff that gets there. You know, the people who are very on, there are two classes of people and there's very online people. And, and a lot of those people are just observers and take the culture wars in and it slowly drives them crazy. And then they have to go, um, be alone with this insanity or listen to, you know, podcasts and are involved in it, but they're not engaging. And then there's the people who just have no idea, which is the majority of people. Yo, the vast, vast majority of people aren't immersed in any of this. That's where like Twitter has been misleading. Yeah. It's like, if you were on Twitter exclusively in the midterms, you thought the Republicans were going to have 98 seats in the Senate and 328 seats in the House because they were just dominating the space. Mm -hmm. But the real world wasn't tuned in to any of that polling. They weren't tuned into any of the shortcomings, the Democratic Party at the time. Not that the Republicans were doing anything good. Uh, but the point is, it's just, it's not reflective of the real world, but it makes a lot of noise because people who work in journalism are very online people and they kind of drive the conversations <laughs> But most of the conversations that happen on TV are not around issues that voters care about. Like you said, we don't tweet as much about inflation. We don't tweet as much about crime. It's starting to happen more. You know, but if you looked at the issues that are kind of driving this election cycle, most of them were not trendy issues two months ago, even though they mattered to voters. Yeah, it's it's weird, too, because I I was guilty of thinking there was going to be a red wave. Uh, um, oh, me, too. But I was also tainted what I realized. And I mean, it's amazing how wrong I get things all the time in media. Just I'm so wrong. Whatever I think, I think Biden's probably going to win. And so <laughs> I'm maybe Trump will win because I've been just wrong. No, uh, no. Listen to me. Kanye's back. He's got a number one album. Plus, all that anti-Semitism is going to get him the Harvard vote. I got Kanye in this thing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. He might. I, I, I feel like, um, yeah, I, I was, I thought that it was going to be a red wave. And then I realized how short term everyone's memory is were, were like goldfish. And <laughs> because I was coming from LA, which was way more locked down than a lot of the red states. And I really thought voters were going to punish the people who literally had people dying alone in hospital beds and Nuts. making people sit six feet apart and not console their grieving parents and funeral. I mean, like I still feel rage about some of the decisions that yeah. they made and thought voters would remember that, but they were mad about Roe. Not crazy. And I was, was like, a, that yeah. was just the most recent thing that they were mad about. <laughs> this, is, this is a thing now. Everybody is a prisoner of the moment. Oh. And I think it has to do with the omnipotence of social media it's and the 24-hour news cycle. Yeah. That we've all decided whatever we're talking about today is the only thing we're ever going to talk about again. So if there's an election tomorrow, we should probably vote based on what we're prioritizing today. And I think that was the lesson from the midterms. Roe was obviously a big issue and it'll continue a big issue for the left. But I think on the right, I think a lot of people took the approach you did, which is the approach I did. I was like, hey, if 70% of the country thinks we're headed in the wrong direction, there's no way the party in power is getting out of this in one piece. Like, it would make sense that you would expect the Democrats to get killed. But then again, this speaks to us not having or maybe me not having the values they did when it comes to Roe. Like, I thought Roe would be a turnout issue. I just didn't think they would successfully use it from the standpoint of, like, there will be no more abortion if the Republicans win, which might be the case in certain states. But I don't think 
it's ever going to be a national thing. Like, I think even Trump, to his credit, at some point is going to announce a ban that's more on par with what they're doing in Europe. He's not going to the mattresses, I don't think, on this. No. Like, I think DeSantis had a more extreme take than Trump did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that that was something, I guess, that surprised me, too, because I thought maybe people were a little squishier about yeah, I, I guess it, they really kind of engage the the young, the younger women to come out for that. But it was surprising to me. No, I I didn't feel like many people really got punished for their insane no. lockdown. Even like the stuff coming out today about the school, you're like, yeah, yeah. no shit. You mean <laughs> learning on Zoom? You're gonna you're not gonna learn? I'm shocked. Yeah. Kids were literally just taking pictures of their face and putting it up on Yo. the screen <laughs> while they played video Yo. games for eight hours a day. <laughs> Dude, my son Lincoln played so much Fortnite, he didn't even know there was a lockdown till the yeah. third month. He was like, he's like, you guys have been home this whole time. That's all they did. They didn't do anything. I saw his laptop open one day for real with what you just described. I saw 35 <laughs> thumbnails on a screen. And I was like, oh, so nobody's learning anything. We just threw away a school year. Because exactly kids are did. savvy and they manipulated the teachers and they were saying, oh, we can't show our background because we're ashamed and we're going to feel like we're like our yep. economics will be revealed and it's not yep. fair. And then they were like, OK, you don't have to show your background. Yo, so true. And there was a thing where they knew how to glitch out, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The posted photo of the frozen screen. We caught Lincoln with one of those. And he confessed to it because when my radio show launched, we were doing it from home. But he had a posted photo. They would screenshot when their screen glitched. They would screenshot it and keep it for classes. I honestly love Gen Z. I think they're hilarious. Truly. They're the like best. some of the funniest kids because they Do grew you? up with all this weirdness and then the lockdowns. Like yes. They're... And what's funny is like, they are weird. It's a generation of kids that don't look at you when they talk to you. Yeah. They're wonderful. Do you know one, this one Gen Z prank, I don't know if you know this or you've seen it online, but I learned this from my kid, but I know a lot of people have engaged in it. During the COVID, so it's not original to him, but during the COVID era, when you had to like send in a clean COVID test, did you catch on to that trend where people were sending in the negative test, but they had something horrific on the TV in the background? No, I didn't see so, this. <laughs> Lincoln got in trouble because he was sending into like his school. If he had to supply a negative COVID test to go on like a field trip, he would send it a negative, a negative COVID test. But in the background on the TV, you could catch half a thumbnail of a very aggressive gay porn <laughs> or something of that nature. And I got a phone call about that. Uh, and I had seen like he had his whole cache. He had like 20 of these test results in his phone. So he had clearly picked the meme up somewhere. And was just repurposing it for his teachers. And I just thought it was the funniest thing in the world. They also started, God bless them, bombing AA meetings. Because yeah, all, yeah. <laughs> all of the AA meetings went online. <laughs> and I'm like, who? what kind of sick fucks would do this? But then I was like, probably bored teenagers. Like, I probably would have done that as a teen, locked down, just like gotten into a gone into a Zoom AA meeting and started playing porn on the TV or like yelling that you're all a bunch of drunks and <laughs> <laughs> there's hope because if these kids are fun for all the fault we find in them, if they're fun, they'll endure. Yeah. Fun conquers all, dude. Fun yeah, conquers all. Fun conquers all. It's true. What what do you think this what are what's your gut feeling now about this election? I mean a lot can change between it's going to be a wild ride. I'm glad I'm glad we have each other. Oh, <laughs> that's so true. Me too. Um, I actually think Trump can win, which is scary. Uh, obviously, as you said, the potential for disaster between now and then is great. I think he might benefit from the lawfare against him, if only because it's going to keep him off the microphone and minimize the unforced errors. Mm. Like, if you, as you saw with the bloodbath comment, they're going to try. They're going to try to run with anything he gives them. And he does give them a lot. Okay, but it's baked into the cake in terms of his supporters. Nobody is, at this point, anyone bothered by what Trump says is incapable of voting for the man. There's nobody still sticking around. Like, there's no, like, 
last straw when it comes to Trump rhetoric. If you right. were capable of having a straw, you were done with it in 2016. Right. So I think the, I think Trump might benefit from the lawfare. It's like something like Stephen A. Smith at ESPN talked about this today. Uh, he talked about how, you know, we in sports always say that you got to beat somebody in the ring. You shouldn't be beating them through, you know, the manipulation of the coaches poll right, or the BCS right. college rankings. And I think that resonates with a lot of people. I think they want this settled in the ring. Yeah. And I think he's uniquely positioned to settle it in the ring, if only because whether he deserves all the credit or not, the country was in better shape under him than it is now. Assuming you give him a free pass for COVID, which somehow everybody does. Like, it's right. amazing how... 99% of the Trump supporters hate Fauci with all the fiber in their being, <laughs> but we wouldn't know who Fauci was were it not for Trump kind of handing him the keys to the family car. Yeah, it's and so, so true. You can tell me in the fog of war, Trump was kind of new to the process and was trying to mitigate the damage being done in an election year, so he wanted to be perceived as listening to public health officials. But the fact remains, I mean, Fauci talked him into destroying his economy, and that's kind of what cost him the election. I just remember when he came back from having COVID. <laughs> yeah. That was epic. <laughs> yeah. Nearly dead. Walked to the White House balcony. <laughs> gave us like a weird <laughs> fist bump. Do you remember when he did the lap in the SUV? Mm -hmm. Outside Walter Reed? Like, that's the thing about Trump I think America needs to make peace with. Like, this isn't going to end with him just quietly going away in the night. We need to have this reckoning. And I think what's happened, and this is where the Democrats are really exposed, is there was so much social pressure to vote against Trump the first two times. And a lot of it is dissipated because the, the arbiters of cool in our country right now, the vast majority of them are black. Rappers, athletes, influencers, and a lot of them that have big following. Stephen A., Ice Cube, Charles Barkley, who talked pretty openly last week about how the Democrats show up every four years, promise to fix everything in the black community. I've been voting Democrat my whole life. Ain't nothing got fixed. OK, that stuff carries a lot more weight than is reflected in polls mm -hmm. and is certainly reflected in any of the cable news analysis. Yeah, like I could tell you this. A lot of my friends are teachers in the inner city right now. Yeah. Teacher in Manhattan. They're getting the biggest issue facing New York City schools is overcrowding. Once you get past the fact that no one can read or do math, getting right. get, getting <laughs> past that. OK, uh, the biggest issue is overcrowding. And he's getting four students a week that don't speak English. And he's averaged four students a week now for 30 weeks, he says. My buddy Steve, we were out Saturday night. And he's like, you understand, I'm sitting on in classrooms that have like 52 kids. If, if legitimately 20 of them don't speak English, you know, how much of an education am I giving that class, including them? Right. And the truth is none. And this is all the end result of the indifference to what happened at the border, right. which the bill always gets passed to the poorest communities. It does. And you can tell me you care about those communities, but as guys like Charles Barkley are starting to notice, Meek Mill, Meek Mill is speaking up. Meek Mill. And I think that's a problem for the Democrats is like, if you want to be like badass, if you want to have an edge, if you want to be punk rock, Trump is the brand. There's no way you, if you want to be cool, there's no way you go, oh, well, I'm voting for the, the guy who shook hands with the invisible people, you know, that's being propped up by the establishment. They lost the cool. They had the cool factor with Obama. Obama was cool. Yeah. Definitely cool. They even had as, as much as I think like Hillary is a, a corporate toady warmonger. They had an element of cool because they had the entirety of Hollywood behind her. And, you know. It was still a historic first coming off the first of Obama. Mm -hmm. And Trump didn't have like major celebrities or anyone we thought was cool. With all due respect to Scott Bayo, I don't think the zeitgeist was ever like Bayo said what? And it's no offense to him, but I think you're starting to see a lot more cool. And yeah. you factor in the MMA thing and everything else. And I think Trump yeah. is a better brand. I just think he's a better brand. I think you can win now by being a better brand. Because I don't think you run for president anymore, Bridge. I think you run for class president. And I think he knows that. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I read some analysis of his first rally. And it was like he was in Waco where... Um, a cult tried to take over, you know, a cult had firearms. And I was like, I'm 
pretty sure you're very detached from how most of America views that now. <laughs> like, I don't think most of America sees the ATF as the good guys and the FBI in this situation. I think he's tapped into the like anti-government on all sides at the moment that that he's he's kind of representing but it was so funny this the way it was presented i was like i feel like that's not how most people view what happened at waco but and again being tapped into that anti-government thing um is only effective because of how bad and inept the government has been yeah and as it pertains to waco like you said he's in touch with the side the people are on yeah. Instead of the side, you know, the five talking heads are on on a CNN panel or an Who ABC panel. Word for Raytheon. Or like the board the, members. The, the, the DOD. <laughs> well said. <laughs> All right. I know you have to go. What is your biggest defect of character? Um, For real, for real? Yeah. Uh, Self care. In that I have a, a very abusive stage dad who lives in my head. <laughs> and that is my work process is yeah. that I have Joe Jackson in my head who screams at me all day that I'm horrible. I get and then it. Right before I go on stage, he compliments me. He's like, you look good, Michael. <laughs> and I perk up and I do like the job of my life. <laughs> do we have the same dad? Um, <laughs> uh, what's your biggest asset? Give that me. I didn't hear the word. I'm sorry. Uh, what's your biggest asset? My biggest asset? Uh, my wife. Uh, my for real. I'm not like buttering her up because I actually li listen to me. I married a farm girl. I, I you know, uh, you know, anyway, uh, well, I guess what I'm trying to say is my wife, Jenny's a really good brand ambassador because she's really funny and she's really cool. And a lot of people, you know, if you meet her and you like if you don't get me, you meet her and you go like, oh, I get it. This guy just doesn't care. And that's my asset. Like, I truly don't care. I don't want to be in charge. And I think the coolest thing you can do right now is not wanting to be cool. Yeah. Okay. And one of the reasons I don't want to be cool is because I have a really cool wife. We hang out. I smoke a lot of cigars. We blast a lot of music in the backyard. We do nothing. Yeah. So it's like right now, as I'm talking to you, my face is on the biggest billboard in Times Square. And it doesn't matter because yeah. my lifestyle hasn't changed. Like, I'm going to go home in my yard tonight and play George Michael till the cops come. <laughs> and that's what I was doing a year ago. And that's what I'll be doing a year from now by the grace of God. Yeah. Oh, uh, I can't wait to meet you in person. Oh, but it's going to happen, man. Come do the show with Landau. That's how you should do it. Oh, my God. We should, I would we love should it. Sleep, we should sleepless in Seattle this. Like, instead of meeting on the Empire State Building, we'll just meet on a TV set. Oh, we would have so much. I just, we just did a sketch together at The Blaze, and I, my cheeks still hurt from, oh, from. Landau, he's so fantastic. He's brilliant. Like, I truly love him. And I love him because he's from an era of stand-up where we knew the difference between a joke and a hate crime. Yeah. And we didn't cater to anybody who didn't know the difference. Yeah. And he's just like, he, it's like guys like you and him who I feel like remind me, like it's the good thing about, it reminds me like why I got into stand up and why I loved it. It's just been, it's been rejuvenating to be, oh, you know, like, dump it. it's nice. I, I didn't realize this was an episode of how Stella got her groove back. <laughs> like a a, lo a low budget spinoff, which we can never make because you're erasing a black character. <laughs> Way to go. It is a little bit. I still got her groove back, but I also have a superpower, and that's my husband too. So yeah, no weird. Like if you have a good person in your life, it's not, like I was. Do you ever talk about like family privilege? Yes. Family privilege is a real thing. If you it's come from a good real. house where the people you grew up around like modeled excellence and empathy. Or you have a significant other that's actually like a legitimately good person. Mm -hmm. It um in your day to day, it's so valuable mm -hmm. because you know people who are in terrible marriages without knowing they're in a terrible. You can just see it on their face, yeah, because they're living in that look of torment. You know those men in their nineties whose default face is like, <laughs> you know that guy, <laughs> yeah. But they've had that face since they were twenty seven years old. I have friends I went to high school who have that face. And if you don't have that face, it's because you're probably in a good situation. So congrats to both of us. Congrats to both of us. I, I think we deserve it with our stage dads. Well, I can't wait to meet you in person. Please stay yeah. in touch. Let us know where we can find all of your stuff. Oh, it's it's going to happen. Uh, follow me on Twitter, that hellhole, at Jimmy Fela, <laughs> F-A-I-L-L-A.
if if you want to see me on tour, foxacrossamerica.com, uh, where all the tickets are. If uh, you want to watch a TV show, it's every Saturday night at 10 p.m. Eastern on the Fox News Channel or every Sunday it replays at 5 p.m. It's always nice to know that we're replaying a game like uh, Strip Club or Daycare at 5 p.m. when people get home from church and they can watch the replay of my show. <laughs> uh, but that replays every Sunday at 5 p.m. And Fox Across America, my radio show that you should come on. Landau's, Landau's on every week. Uh, we oh, started fine. on 27 stations. We're on about 165 now. Uh, if you're not on, if we're not on your local affiliate, you can even hear that on like the Fox News app or foxacrossamerica.com. But I'm pretty sure most of that's going away after this interview, no? No. I kid. I, you stop it. I love you. This was great. No. And your the book, best. everybody should get your book because it's a really great read and it's, Aww. it's I, just. I love that you want more for my book because I'm so done with it. I do. So, you know what I, I know because it's that. like a book I could have it's like the book I, I I just I know you have to go and I don't I want no, right. I don't want to get in trouble by Connor but I I I I'm terrified of him. Um I I do want more for your book and I I am going to keep promoting it and give it to people oh, for Christmas. You stop it. Um, and we'll see each other soon. Let me know if you're ever coming through Texas. Oh, it's a thing. I'll be at Dallas. I'll be at the Majestic Theater June 7th. Oh, okay. But we'll find each other. I'll get you tickets if you're in, if you're in the hood. But we'll yeah. find each other before then. I promise. Okay. Uh, I, my I miss friend. you already. I miss Thanks you already. Now. Thanks for coming on. You're the best. Bye, Bye Bridget. This has been Walk Ins Welcome with Bridget Fetisy. I'm Bridget Fetisy, and you're welcome. It's <laughs> <laughs> the dumbest line. <laughs>